Good morning, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome, delighted to be worshiping with you and you and you and you and those of you who may be worshiping with us online. Hope the Lord will bless you as we gather in Christ's name today to give him honor and glory and praise, which is all of his due. Please notice the opportunities for worship and study and fellowship and service, which you have printed in your bulletin, some special things coming along, extraordinary events, so you don't want to miss a one, read up all about it. Let me highlight just a couple of things. We are just three weeks away from Easter Sunday, and that means for South Lake Church, uh, a, an offering to the community of Easter Sunrise Services, again at McGuire Nuclear Station, our just around the corner neighbor here. And uh, we need a few more volunteers. Many of you have already signed in for some very important roles in putting that uh, service together. But we need a few to work in food service and to have a few extra hands unassigned until that morning. There's always a gap or two that needs to be filled. And so we're very glad to have some extras, so to speak. There's a sign-up sheet there. We don't need many, maybe eight or ten. Uh, but you sign up either for food service or just to be an extra standby hand, and we'll be glad for your uh, participation. Begin to talk that up, by the way. We're going to be beginning some uh, online uh, promotion and advertising uh, in this next uh, week, Lord willing, <clears throat> and some signs in the neighborhood, in the communities also. So we hope to, to see this uh, expand as we get the word out that this is an opportunity for an entire, entire community. Also, a couple of special occasions for... Uh, some contact with our missionary friends. We have to grab them when we can get them because the missionaries from overseas are here only occasionally and then very briefly on a tight schedule. So we've got two coming sort of close together, but as I say, we take them when we can get them. Uh, one of those is going to be on Sunday the 24th where we'll have a special <coughs> adult Sunday school class combined to hear from one of our missionary friends, Mr. Ilderton. But then also on the 27th, on a Wednesday night, there's a dessert for the entire congregation here at the church. Uh, so we can hear from Micah and Blair Vickery, who have been serving in um, a Muslim situation and have come home now to take care of some elderly parents. But we can get a good overview of what the Lord has done through them as they come to speak to us on the 27th. That dessert is open to everybody, but we do need you to RSVP, read the bulletin and see how to do that so we can know how to prepare for your participation. A great night, a great weekend this weekend, actually, with the presentation of the Willy Wonka, the high school musical presented here. Another blazing uh, success. I was in attendance last night. The room was packed. I guess, was that typical of all five shows packed out every, every time? That's just tremendous. Uh, we had some folks here who were really uh, p putting their best foot forward. Ian, Ian Johnson, our leader of our tech team, was the tech director for the whole operation, and it was fantastic. He was assisted by James Smith. And then Laura Smith had quite a starring role in Willy Wonka as Mrs. Uh, Glump. Yeah, with her German accent carried out to perfection. Uh, congratulations, all who were in involved in a wonderful, wonderful uh, show. And also to those who worked so hard last night to get us back into a church setting for this morning. It was quite an operation to turn this thing around, but it worked out great. Hear God's word now as he himself calls us to worship. You will seek me, God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Let us pray. Father, in the face of such a gracious promise as this, we dare ask just one more thing, that you would grant us those hearts that truly, fully seek you in this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand. Come the fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of love is praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, some by clinging tongues of love. Praise the mountain, fix the
Please be seated. We're reading this morning from the Proverbs, Wisdom of Solomon, the third chapter, verses 1 through 8. This which you hold in your hand is the Word of God, which is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It is that which penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Indeed, there is nothing in all creation which can be hid from God's sight. Hear now His Word. Proverbs 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, and shun evil. This will bring health to your body, and nourishment to your bones. Amen. Let's bow in a time of prayer, especially focused in this moment on confession of sins. You pray, deal with the Lord in the way that is right and good, and then I'll lead us in a corporate prayer and also have a word of encouragement and assurance for you. Let us pray. Father, do forgive us those many times when we have been wise in our own eyes. If we will remember, and if we're honest, we'll have to admit that those occasions generally did not turn out very well. Some were disastrous. But never once when we trusted in You, never once when we really leaned on You with all our hearts, never once have we been disappointed. We acknowledge that we've often been forgetful of your teaching. We acknowledge that we've not always kept your commands, or not often, actually. We recognize that faithfulness has eluded us. Our love for you has dwindled, has almost been lost at times. Forgive us. And help us, Lord, to know, help us really to believe that your ways, your ways are the ways that bring life, that bring prosperity, that bring us a good name with men and a good name with you. Your ways are those ways which lead us along straight paths to the discovery of all good things, including the health of our bodies, the health of our souls. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, and thank you for your absolute sufficiency, for life abundant here, and life with you eternally. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's the assurance of God's holy word, that Christ himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. And so, believing, repentant sinner, know, believe that in Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Have you ever noticed 
how a word, the same word, the same really meaning can change depending on its application. I'll give you an example. It's one thing to walk out into your driveway and see that car that's maybe three or four years old and say, hmm, I need a new car. It's a whole nother thing to be broken down for the fifth time on the side of the road and say, I need a new car. In the similar way, it's one thing to be sitting at home, maybe watching TV and say, you know, I need, I need some water. It's a whole nother thing to be working outside or to be running a race in 100 degree weather and say, I need some water. The first song we're gonna do is, I need you precious Jesus. And we come today, not as the owner of a three-year-old car, not as someone who is just enjoying himself or herself on the couch watching TV and a little thirsty. We come as people who are driving that broken down car. We come as people who, whose mouth is parched from the heat in great need. Because in our great need, he comes and meets us. Please stand. I need thee, precious Jesus, for I am full of sin. My soul is dark and guilty. My heart is dead within. I need the cleansing fountain where I can always flee. The blood of Christ most precious, the sinner's perfect plea. I need thee. I need thee, precious Jesus, for I am very poor, a stranger and a pilgrim. I have no earthly store. I need the love of Jesus to cheer me on my way, to guide my doubting footsteps, to be my strength and say, I need thee. I need thee today. I need thee, precious Jesus. I need a friend like thee, a friend to soothe and pity, a friend to care for me. I need the heart of Jesus to feel each anxious care.
Take me as you find me All my fears and failures Fill my life again I give my life to follow Everything I believe in Now I That pays so dearly 
Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to ask the ushers and deacons to come forward for our morning tithes and offerings. Thank you, Mike. Hebrews 10, 25 teaches us, let us not give up meeting together, as some of you are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So glad to see everyone here this morning. Please join me in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so merciful and lord as your word teaches us the earth cries out that you are the wonder of your creation all around us we are reminded of how wonderful how great you are and lord we have gathered together here today to worship you and to worship you as your son taught us in spirit and in truth Lord, I pray that your spirit would fill this place today and that you would be once again gracious to us, that would, we would see you through worship, giving of our tithes and offerings, singing praises to you, hearing your word preached and applying it to our lives. Lord, we thank we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. And Lord, as we, we see ourselves and know our needs, we live in a fallen world, Lord, with suffering and pain and, and challenges. But Lord, we know that you are there with us. You love us and you care for us. Lord, we pray for the leadership of this country as we get into this election season. There's so, so much attention to be paid, but Lord, your word teaches us that you raise up kings and you tear down kings. We know that it is in your hands, and so we pray for your wisdom and your guidance as we navigate these times. We pray for the leadership of South Lake Academy as they look for a new head of school. We thank you for Rebecca Leonard and, and the the job that she will do as the interim. So be with the people who are involved in that search. Give them wisdom as they make those selections. The leadership of this church, the elders and the deacons, Lord, we thank you for their service. We pray that you would just fill them as they need. As Dan brings your word this morning, Lord, I pray that you would fill his heart, comfort him, and that only that which you would desire come from his mouth. He would preach truth 
and that this congregation would hear what you would have us to hear and apply it to our lives. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who doesn't know you as Savior and Lord, that today would be the day of salvation. And Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, Boys and girls, our time together is here. Meet me up front for the children's message. Glad to see you this morning. Welcome to church. Had to, got, had to get up early this morning, didn't you? Or did you know? Did you tell any difference? The time changed, and all of a sudden it was time to go. Well, no, you wouldn't have noticed, but I bet mom and dad did. I bet mom and dad did. <clears throat> if they complain about getting up early, tell them it's just good practice for the Easter sunrise service. <laughs> Here's the word of God for us today. Here's what the Bible says. This really comes from Jesus. Simply. Let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Now, what does that mean? He's saying, whenever you have something to say, say what you mean, and mean what you say. It's not necessary to have a lot of words, to speak a lot of words, to try to get somebody to believe you. You just simply tell the truth and then do what you say you're going to do. It's sort of interesting to see how God's truth shows up in some very unusual places sometimes. For example, in this book, Horton Hatches the Egg by a man named Dr. Seuss. Let me read a little bit of it to you. Side Maisie a bird hatching an egg. I'm tired and I'm bored and I've kinks in my leg from sitting, just sitting here day by day. It's work. How I hate it. I'd much rather play. I'd take a vacation, fly off for a rest. If I could find someone to stay on my nest, if I could find someone, I'd fly far away, free. Then Horton the elephant passed by her tree. Hello, called a lazy bird, smiling her best. You're, you've nothing to do, and I do need a rest. Would you like to sit on the egg in my nest? The elephant laughed. Why, of all the silly things. I haven't feathers, and I haven't wings. Me on your egg? Why, that doesn't make sense. Your egg is so small, ma'am, and I'm so immense. Tut, tut, answered Maisie. I know you're not small but I'm sure you can do it, no trouble at all. Just sit on it softly. You're gentle and kind. Come, be a good fellow. I know you won't mind. I can't, said the elephant. Please, begged the bird. I won't be gone long, sir. I give you my word. I'll hurry right back. Why, I'll never be missed. Very well, said the elephant, since you insist. You want a vacation, go fly off and take it. I'll sit on your egg, and I'll not try to break it. I'll say, stay and be faithful. I mean what I say. Toodaloo, sang out Maisie, and fluttered away. Hmm, the first thing to do, murmured Horton, let's see. The first thing to do is to prop up this tree and make it much stronger. That has to be done before I get on it. I must weigh a ton. Then carefully, tenderly, gently, he crept up the trunk to the nest where the little egg slept. 
Then Horton the elephant smiled. Now that's that. And he sat, and he sat, and he sat, and he sat. And he sat all that day, and he kept the egg warm. And he sat all that night through a terrible storm. It poured, and it lightninged, it thundered, it rumbled. This isn't much fun, the poor elephant grumbled. I wish she'd come back, because I'm cold, and I'm wet. I hope that that Maisie bird doesn't forget. But Maisie, by this time, was far beyond reach, enjoying the sunshine way off in Palm Beach. And having such fun, such a wonderful rest, decided she'd never go back to her nest. Mm. So Horton kept sitting there day after day, and soon it was autumn. The leaves blew away, and then came the winter, the snow and the sleet, and icicles hang from his trunk and his feet. But Morton kept sitting and said with a sneer, with, excuse me, I misread that. But Horton kept sitting and said with a sneeze, I'll stay on this egg, and I won't let it freeze. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant, an elephant's faithful 100%. So poor Horton sat there the whole winter through. And then came the springtime with troubles anew. His friends gathered round and they shouted with glee, Look, Horton, the elephant's up in the tree. They taunted, they teased him, they yelled. How absurd. Old Horton, the element, elephant, thinks he's a bird. They laughed and they laughed. Then they all ran away. And Horton was lonely. He wanted to play. But he sat on the egg. And continued to say, I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant's faithful 100%. Maybe your mom and dad can read the rest of that to you later on. You don't have that at home? Well, I bet mom and dad know what to do about that. Nine ninety nine on Amazon.prime. <laughs> Now, who in that story did not do what they said they were going to do? Who did not do it? What do you think, the Levi? The bird. The, the bird. bird. The bird did not do what she said she was going to do. Who in that story did do what he said he was going to do? Evie? The elephant. Exactly. Saw your nose. It was the elephant. The elephant did what he said he was going to do. Jesus wants us to do what we say we're going to do. Be careful what we promise to do, but do what we say we're going to do. God wants us to be faithful 100%. Now, I want you to listen carefully to the sermon that's coming up, and at the end, I want you to be able to tell me which man did not do what he said he was going to do, and which man did do what he said he was going to do. Which man, which man is going to be, which, in the sermon now, well, we haven't gotten to the sermon yet. In the sermon, which man was faithful 100%? All right? Let's, 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 let's pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Thank you for warning us about ways that we could be unfaithful to you and to others. Help us to be strong and let our yes be yes and our no be no making sure we always do what we say we're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continuing our survey of the Passion Week of the Lord in Mark's Gospel today, 14th chapter. Uh, we have seen already how Jesus has been arrested after his prayer time alone in Gethsemane, how he was hauled before the Sanhedrin for this judgment, this mock trial. And now we come to the episode that follows immediately involving the Apostle Peter. So we're in Mark chapter 14, verse 66. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. 
When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said. And he went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near Peter said to him, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Please pray with me. Father, this is an important part of what we've come here today for, to hear from you, to sit under your word taught and preached. So make it count for us. Not that your word will ever fail, but Lord, we're faulty. And so we pray for your help in paying attention, but also in understanding. And so come, Spirit of God, be our light. Guide us into truth. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Well, Jesus had told Peter what was going to happen. He told him early this same night, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. That's what Jesus had predicted. And now here we have Simon Peter doing exactly that thing. That's exactly what we find him doing as Jesus had predicted. Peter never, never would have believed it of himself, of course. No, Lord, he'd insisted when that suggestion was made. Even if all fall away, I will not. And so here we are, maybe what? Maybe three hours after that declaration. And now disown him, Peter does. So here is Peter, the disciple, following Jesus faithfully one minute. And the next minute acting like he doesn't even know the man. What is wrong with this picture? What has gone on here? We find in Peter this inconsistency, which is so terribly unattractive. I mean, is he a disciple or not? Or is he only sometimes a disciple? One of the challenges that I, as a 75-year-old Presbyterian minister face is trying to live a consistent life. Hate to disappoint you if you thought more of me than that, but it's where I live and where I struggle. Trying to live a life with some real consistency. And I expect I'm not alone in that. I expect you're somewhere along in that condition uh, as well. You know, we can find lots of ways to deny Jesus. Lots of ways. Some elder or deacon is always sidling up to me and asking me to pray for him that he might give a more faithful witness in his workplace, which is to say, I think, he feels like he's not doing that now. A teenager signs an abstinence before marriage commitment in a Saturday night rally, but by the next Saturday night, is finding the real difficulty of keeping that vow. Even little children say they love Jesus, they want to follow Jesus, and then they find themselves disobeying mom and dad, generally involving themselves in all kinds of mischief, meanness, rebellion. So, all of us being more or less in the same boat, what help is there, fellow strugglers, as we look into Peter's situation, if we find ourselves in that category of one who would like, who, who really desires to follow Christ more closely, 
someone who desires to be a more full-time disciple rather than a sometimes disciple, what help is there here in this passage? The first helpful thing, I suppose, is to recognize that anyone can fail. Anyone can fall. I mean, if Peter can fall, anyone can fall. Peter, he was after all the bold, the courageous leader of all the others, the one among all the disciples who stepped out of the boat. Nobody else climbed over, but he stepped out of the boat to walk on the waves. The one who among all the others expressed his loyalty to Christ so vehemently. He was the only one who drew his sword there in the garden and whacked off the ear of the, of the uh, servant of the high priest. All the other disciples ran away. But Peter followed Jesus right up to the high priest's courtyard. He may have scattered with the others, as doubtless he did for a moment, but then he collected himself somewhere along the way. He turned around, and while they continued their flight over the hills, he went to the very place where Jesus was being tried. Eventually, Peter may have failed, but at least he failed in a situation which, according to Mark, none of these other disciples even dared to face. So giving credit where credit is due, he held out longer than most, yes. In the end, however, still he failed. Some fall early, some fall late, but the truth is anyone can fall. I'd like to suggest to you that everyone will fall, except in those cases where the omnipotent power of the grace of God holds us up. All will certainly fall. We're weak. We're vulnerable. Peter didn't realize just how vulnerable he was. So his warning here is a warning against self-confidence. His experience here is a warning against self-confidence. Here's this big, strong Peter, a boisterous, rough-and-tumble sort. Why does WWE Smackdown come to mind? Here's the one who confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the one who protested, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. And when he falls, it is in the face of the mere suspicion of a little servant girl who simply suggests, you were also with that Nazarene Jesus. That's no strenuous challenge. That's no harsh accusation, just a kind of tentative suggestion, and big bad Peter crumbles. I, no, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know this man. How humiliating. <laughs> How disgraceful to have been brought so low by the mild suggestion of a little girl. So much for self-confidence. And also worth noting, Peter's vulnerability is found in the most unlikely spot. If you would ask any of his fellow disciples about Peter, what kind of man he was, what he was capable of, where his strengths lay, what his weak points were, none of them would ever have said that he would fall on account of cowardice. But that's exactly where the devil hit him. That's exactly where he went down. Our adversary, the devil, is a wily creature. And complicating the matter further, our fallen human nature is a mysterious thing. Back in the old days before TV, when folks listened to the radio, the announcer would ask, who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? And the answer would be, the shadow knows. In reality, it's only Jesus, only God in heaven, who knows the evil that lurks in the hearts of men in its fullness. And so in our efforts to live consistently for the Lord, no point should be left unguarded. Most of all, perhaps, those points at which we think we would be least likely to have trouble. And so anybody can fall, and sometimes in the most surprising ways. And so there is no room for this self-confidence in the life of a consistent uh, disciple. Our second lesson from Peter's sad experience is to beware the little things. Beware the little things. During the course of a day, it's often those little things in which our real trial comes. In these big dramatic moments, Peter stood the test pretty well. 
in the garden with the mob pressing in, the torches blazing, the weapons at the ready, Peter had been valiant. He said he'd go to the death for Jesus. And in that moment when he said it, he was willing to prove it. So out comes his sword and off comes Malchus's ear. And if he himself had been arrested, if he had been tied up and hauled along to, with, with Jesus to the court of the high priest as a prisoner, I kind of expect he would have stood faithful there too. Big dramatic scene. But the devil, who was sifting him like wheat, had a much finer sieve than that. Had Peter been brought in for formal trial, he could have girded himself up, made a special heroic effort. But Peter's trial turns out to be much more subtle. You look at the situation in which he finally disgraced himself, and there's really nothing to it at all. Just a very ordinary, unremarkable scene. No high priest presiding there in all of his grandeur. No element of, of the majesty of a judgment hall. No outward drama, really. Just Peter and a few household servants to help. Some bored temple police, perhaps, between assignments, hanging out. Hanging out there in the darkened courtyard, standing around the glowing charcoal fire, trying to keep warm, just passing the time. All the big doings were inside. Not much going on here. Not much that meets the eye, however. It is, in reality, Peter's greatest failure. It is the scene for his most heinous sin. But none of this is apparent on the surface. Just a few casual questions, a few casual responses. A trivial exchange, really. But cloaked within. A deep sin. One that strikes at the fundamental issue. Are you a follower of Jesus or not? Such treacherous subtlety as this. It wasn't the grand occasion for heroism that Peter had imagined. This, his real trial, why this trial was over before it ever got started. The trap was cunningly set, and Peter walked right into it. He'd even been warned. I don't know this man, he said, for the third time as the rooster crows. John's account, the apostle John gives an account of this and says that at that moment when he said that and the cock crowed, Jesus turned and looked right at him. And only then did Peter realize the devil had him. Beware the little things. Beware the undramatic things. The routine, day-to-day -day things. That's where some of the most dangerous traps have been set. And is it my imagination, or is there another lesson here? A lesson about the danger of trying to follow a middle course. Peter surely came to this dark courtyard with mixed feelings. He really loved Jesus. He was anxious to see what was going to happen to him. But although he'd run away once, he was too ashamed to keep going like the others, perhaps. So he did follow in, but at a distance. He did not stick close to Jesus either. He loved him. He was interested. He was engaged, but not closely engaged. Peter loved Jesus too much to desert him entirely. But he was too much of a coward to go in and stand shoulder to shoulder with Jesus, to come alongside him. Maybe he could go part way, making a respectable enough showing and not risk too much. But as it turned out, this halfway position was worst of all. At least the men who ran away didn't have this kind of denial on their record. Peter made the mistake of thinking that he could follow Jesus from a distance. Trying to be a disciple while at the same time blending in with the crowd whenever things got a little tight, whenever things got a little uncomfortable. Commentator B.F. Westcott describes it as a matter of Peter's having joined the company of the indifferent spectators. And surely this is a plague in the 21st century church in America, trying to get enough Jesus to be respectable, but not so much as to be inconvenienced. 
But Peter's lesson to us is that there's danger in trying to keep your distance from the Lord. When Jesus calls a person to follow him, he calls him to follow in his steps. That means right behind him. But sometimes we hold back, thinking the closer we are to Jesus, the more danger there's going to be. Although actually, although the exposure is greater there perhaps, the danger is less up close. Because Christ is the victor. I've read the end of the book. He's guaranteed victory. And the place to be really safe, though it puts you in the midst of the battle, is to be right next to him, to be close up next to him. Well, how are we to avoid Peter's mistake? Or better yet, how are we to recover having made that mistake already? What word would Scripture have to instruct us today? Perhaps this, that no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Always provide a means of escape. Always. It's not necessary to sin. Never is it necessary to sin. The promise of the Word of God is there's always a way to avoid it. How could Peter have avoided this? You know the story. Peter got into trouble because he failed to pray. And our great defense is to be found in prayer. The same night when Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, he took these three disciples with him. You remember when we reviewed it a few weeks ago, Peter, James, and John. Jesus prayed, but Peter didn't pray. Now, at first glance, this seems to be a rather strange arrangement, sort of a backwards situation. If we were to pick someone who, in our opinion, did not necessarily need to pray, it would obviously have been the Lord. And if we were to pick someone who needed prayer, it obviously would have been Peter. But Peter is sleeping in the garden while the Lord is pouring out his soul before the Heavenly Father. Watch and pray, you men, so that you'll not fall into temptation. That's what Jesus told Peter and the others. But repeatedly, you know how it is, he came back to check on them, and there they were asleep. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak, Jesus had concluded. And before this, Peter had been warned, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Peter didn't take these warnings seriously at all, these admonitions to pray, and so he fell. Bible teacher Howard Hendricks wrote of this, that Peter was passive when he should have been active, and he was active when he should have been passive. Jesus said, get active, watch and pray, and he went to sleep. The mob came. Jesus was offering himself for a rest. Peter drew his sword, <laughs> cut off the ear, put the sword away, Jesus told him. He was active with the sword when he should have been passive. He got it exactly backward. Our great defense is to be found in the means that Lord, the Lord has promised us, has provided for us, the means of prayer. Peter fell because he didn't use it. And I'm sure one of the reasons he fell in God's providence is to provide so vivid a lesson as this to us, so that maybe we would not make the same mistake. As serious as Peter's fall was in the, his denial of Jesus, and it was serious, it could have been worse, it really could have been, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, Jesus said. And the you here of whom he speaks is all of the disciples. It's a plural. Satan has asked to sift all you men like wheat. But then Jesus continues, but I've prayed for you, Simon. And this time the you is singular. I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Peter fell, but he didn't fall as far as he might have fallen because Jesus had prayed for him. If Peter wouldn't pray for himself, then Jesus would pray for him. And although his fall was great, it was not final. 
He did rise again. He was restored. He was not cut off forever. And so this is an indication of our great weakness, yes, but also of Christ's great compassion. Keep watch. Pray. The devil is real. The traps are cruel. But even when we are caught, even when due to our own negligence and carelessness, we fall into a sin that could have been avoided, when we suffer a lapse in our discipleship, our fall does not put us beyond reach of the Lord who prayed for us and is still praying. It's a wise man who understands that anyone can fall. A wise man who remains on guard even in the little things. A wise man who makes watchfulness and prayer his great defense. And a wise man who recognizes his desperate need for Jesus every day, every hour. Boys and girls, did you hear the story? In this story, which man did not do what he must, what he should have done. Which man did not do what he should have done? Tell me. Peter. Peter. What man did what he said he was going to do? What man was faithful, who said what he meant and was faithful 100%? What man? Jesus. Jesus. Not the elephant. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for your great faithfulness, unswerving in the face of this horror, in the face of this cosmic disintegration. Uh, Lord, thank you that you stood firm. Where would we be without that great faithfulness? Help us to come after you closely so that we would not be sometimes a disciple, but a faithful one right to the end. In your own great name we pray. Amen. Please stand. I need thee every hour most gracious Lord no people of God, receive the blessings of God. May God, who gives endurance and encouragement, give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.